Hi everybody, I'm Bill Evans, and I am going to tell you a little bit about my banjo. I've owned this banjo for about six years, and I'm very, very lucky to have it. Uh, it's a Gibson Granada from 1930. It's an original flathead, but it was a tenor banjo uh, in its first incarnation when it left the Gibson factory in 1930. And, uh, you know, what you can do with the banjo uh, that is not so easy to do on other instruments is you can swap necks out on it pretty easily. So when um, someone is playing an old banjo like this from the pre-World War II years, oftentimes it was originally a tenor banjo or a plectrum banjo. Those instruments were more commonly played than the five-string banjo in the 1920s and 1930s. This was originally a tenor banjo and um, what what you do is you take that neck off and you have one of the great neck builders around the country build you a five-string neck. And uh, in this case, this neck was built by Frank Neat from Russell Springs, Kentucky. And um, the Granada is a maple banjo. Uh, some of the other banjos that Gibson made in the pre-war years would be mahogany and also walnut. And uh, this is the original resonator, and you can see the, the nice curly maple. And then the other distinguishing characteristic of a Granada, whether it's an old one or one that Gibson made in, in uh, its the reissue era from the late 1980s through... Uh, through 2005 or 6. Also gold plating characterizes the Granada. Sonny Osborne plays a Granada. Uh, Earl Scruggs also plays a Granada. Uh, when you see pictures of Earl and his banjo, the, all the gold had rubbed off of his banjo. So it's still, it's still a Granada, but the plating had worn through and it looked silver, but still it never, nevertheless a Granada. I love this instrument. I wake up every morning and, it's, and I look forward to playing it. Um, you know, maple tends to have, um, it's so hard to describe the differences that different kinds of wood will lend to the sound of a banjo. An individual setup, how tight the head is, what kind of bridge you're using, uh, what kind of strings can do so much to color the sound. But in general, maple can be thought of as being a little more direct in terms of just, an, and you hear the note immediately, but also with the gold, it tends to be a little bit sweeter. Where mahogany is going to be a little complex, maybe a little bit darker, depending upon the setup, and also um, not quite as immediate. And again, I just love the sound of this instrument. The serial number on this banjo is 9522-25, and there's some websites that you can go to and look at what that really means in relationship to other Gibson instruments. But what the, the banjo serial numbers mean, the first number, which is most you know frequently four digits, sometimes three, refers to a lot number. So the lot number was 9522. If you were in the Gibson factory in 1930 when, when these banjos were put together, you'd see a lot of cubby holes, maybe 20 or 30 of them. I'm not sure how many. That And, and the workers would just drop the different banjo parts into the cubby hole looking at the order. And all of those banjo would, banjos would comprise one lot number. So that's 9522. This was made uh, alongside and on the same day as several other flathead uh, granadas as well. The second number, in my case 25, is this banjo was in cubby hole 25 in the lot 9522. It's fascinating stuff, isn't it? And, uh, you know, what I like about these pre-war granadas and, oh, man, what I've heard on this instrument that I just love is the fact that when, you know, we play a lot of notes when we play banjo. And the interesting thing about this banjo is that you get a lot of nice sustain. But then when you play the next note, the first note is gone. And so there, you don't have this uh, blending uh, of the notes that can come, kind of create a muddy sound, but yet there's a tremendous amount of sustain with this instrument. And I love the sound up the neck. And you get a lot of variety of, of sound depending upon how close you are to the bridge. You're going to get a nice kind of aggressive bluegrass sound. If I'm playing some, a more contemporary piece or something in melodic or single string style, I might play it here. If I'm playing backup, I might kind of move all the way here to where it's sweetest. And this banjo just sounds great in all those ways. Banjo players love to experiment with bridges. And I have got on this instrument a bridge made by Silvio Ferretti. He's a, a, an Italian great banjo player from Italy. And um, he's a doctor, as I understand, but he makes banjo bridges in his spare time. And I've, he even makes total banjos. And, and this is marketed as a scorpion bridge. And um, in terms of the setup, I use GHS strings I have for many years. And I've noticed that um, 
as the years have gone by, a lot of my own banjo heroes, I'm doing the same thing that they are. We're moving towards lighter gauge strings, although it depends upon the instrument. But um, from low to high, these are J, um, GHS strings. This is a JD20. It's called a JD after JD Crow. There's no coating on the wound fourth string. It makes it sound more like JD. It does, I'm sure of it. And the third string is a 13, second string is a 12, first string is a 10, and the fifth string is a 10. Um, gosh, what else to say about this banjo? I have, you know, I spend a lot of time messing around with the setup. Uh, and, and if I have a free hour, I may try a different bridge just to see what it sounds like. And of course, you can experiment with the head tightness with drum dials and kind of hearing the pitch. And I just have a very regular kind of normal setup here. The head's not too tight, not too loose. The tailpiece not too far down, that would kind of squash the sound, not too far up. Um, all right, oh, one of the cool things about this um, banjo is that if you take a look at the tailpiece, or excuse me, not the tailpiece, the armrest, there's that funny looking knob right there. And this banjo originally had a mute on the inside of it that was operated by, by pressing down or lifting up on the armrest. And this is a lock nut where if it's in various positions, you can move, move, actually move the tail, um, excuse me, the armrest up and down. And then that pulled and pushed a lot of springs and levers that were inside the banjo. And eventually a piece of felt would get pushed up against the bridge. When I got the banjo, um, it had all of that inside of it and it worked. And then I started playing gigs and I would, you know, be playing something. And then about halfway through the piece, it would start to sound like this. And then the mute just would kick in without me wanting it to happen. So I ended up taking it out and I've got it in a paper bag at home. But at any rate, that's the story of this banjo. Um, I guess these are considered to be, you know, pretty desirable pre-war instruments. And, and uh, people will, will talk a lot about, you know, whether these old banjos are really worth all the trouble. And... Um, I'm just glad that I have this because I just think it has a sound that I haven't heard from any other instrument ever. And, uh, and uh, I hope you've enjoyed it in these lessons too. So there you have it, Gibson Grana 9522-25. I'm Bill Evans, and thanks for joining me here at Peghead Nation.